Hey everybody, Edo here, and I am excited today because I have Nigel Matthews from ShipQuest on the line. Say hello, Nigel. Hey, good to be back, Ed. <laughs> yes, yes. This is uh, our, our second video chat interview q and I'll link the previous um, in, in, in the description. And you're the um, CEO of ShipQuest, sometimes referred to as GamesQuest, but ShipQuest. Um, can you, just to dive in, we're actually going to talk a lot about customs and freight and a bunch of interesting really thrilling topics but before... people are going to be loving it they love yeah. it I mean, yeah. it's just like send you to sleep job but uh, important to send you to sleep stuff really yeah yeah i'm already passing out but before i do <laughs> can you give an overview of your sort of expanded services because you guys do a lot uh and so i think it's worth everyone get an idea of that before we dive in so uh, we, we talk to a lot of uh, pre-launch companies um, in terms of even before they launch their Kickstarter. And, and then people say, I, I tried to describe how we do that. I mean, and actually you're part of my pitch because you were my second ever customer and you're, you're still with us. Yeah, um, Steve Finn. Steve the other one. And, and what are we? We are, we are what, I, what, what do I term us? I don't describe ourselves. We are a Kickstarter logistics partner. So we go, um, so we describe ourselves as a partner because our success is based on your success you know we are the way that we structure our pricing and blah 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 is the fact that we are not revenue driven we are parcel driven so we make our profit on whatever we charge on shipping our profit is the same so we we're very much in a mindset of saying well can you know can we add value to to potential kickstarter projects um in order for them to maximize their opportunity if we can do that and they ship more parcels then We'll, we 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 well, get more backers so that we ship more parcels. We we're, we're all going to win. So we developed this partnership and and what we call value add. How do we add value? Because yeah, I could be like an Amazon and go yeah, well look, listen, here's my warehouse address. Send me the product and I'll ship it out for you. God damn it! But we do a little bit more than that. So um, we offer a lot of uh, a lot of advice and guidance. Um, oh, so, 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 so Nigel, let, let me dive in for a second. Let's just pull it sure. even back further. So you're you're sure. you might not know from the act but you're you're based in the the uk right we're based in the uk yeah. you have warehouses in in the uk and in uh, uh other europe european countries or now european countries post brexit and yeah. so these this partnership you're talking about with kickstarter creators this is for the purpose of helping them do international uk eu and worldwide shipping right oh absolutely yeah, yeah just shipping to give a, 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 a premise on logistics. top of it Logistics. Yeah, no, absolutely. Logistics. So, what, what, so it obviously starts from the moment it's going to leave the factory in terms of the actual logistics. So helping you get your, your freight from the factory to our hub. So we have a hub in Germany and we have a hub in the UK. So we can do EU um, friendly shipping and we can do UK friendly shipping as well. So, um, so yeah, um, essentially that's what we do. We, you know, the core of our business is to take your product, get your product, um, Pick, pack it, get it out there, right. and get it out to your backers. Essentially, that's that. That is the core of what we do. Right. But we've expanded our services, which are essentially free services, if you like, uh, in terms of advice and guidance. Va value uh, add. Value add. How do we value add? How do we help you navigate the wonderful quagmire that it is the VAT laws that have changed in the um, in the UK and the EU, or you know, on July the first they changed in the EU. So how do we help you get to that? How do we help you understand how you can maximise your marketing and introduce you to different marketing companies that can help you in, and that's that sort of stuff. And even even to the point that we do a free post on our social media to try and get you more backers. Sure. So sure. how do we help? add value for you to understand because i don't know what you think ed but you know almost um you know kickstarter back in your day was almost like a marketing tool it would do your sure. marketing for you it would get your name out there now you have to market the marketing tool you know um in order to do that so so you know we just go what are you doing where are you at and and, and little things like don't launch your game in August. It's everybody's on holidays in the EU. Why would you do that? Um, you know, so uh, just little things like that yeah. that we can go. Listen, we want you to succeed because if you get more backers, we get more parcels. So, so we try and, to add value and advice <coughs> and guidance right the way through before you even launch. So. And 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 I, I can certainly speak to that. We've obviously uh, did I don't know at this point thirteen or fourteen projects together where you've handled it, uh, a portion of it. And in addition to just the services and and fulfillment and logistics part of it, certainly it's the case that we regularly have conversations um, about. 
the Kickstarter? What are we going to do about, you know, certainly we've been deep in conversations about UK and EU backers and, 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 and tax and VAT and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, in terms of that fulfillment, uh, you know, it, it starts at freight, so it can include, it doesn't have to, right? Like you, you, you have a sort of pick what you need service, but, right. you know, it can include getting it from the, 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 all the way from the factory in China through to, to, to the, you know, the person in the UK or EU or wherever. Um, and, and so there's a lot of steps along the way. Uh, and it's something you guys have been specializing for, you know, coming on. I mean, I don't know when you started, started, but it probably six or seven years ago was this specific um, effort around yep. Kickstarters. Um, so you, I mean, I would venture to guess, let me see if I can get anywhere close. Um, would you say over the last year, the, do you have a, do you, do you know, would you say over the last year, uh, over the last six to seven years, you've done fulfillment for a thousand Kickstarters? Is that, is that too big? Is it more or less more? How many would you say yeah. you've done? Higher, 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 higher. I, I think we think around about 3,000 nice. um, Kickstarter projects because we do uh, – the wonderful thing about, about – as, as I, I, I tell people when I mention you and Dr. Pin Games to start with, when <laughs> – oh, it's a funny story because I go like, yeah, and then, and then Dr. Pin goes, oh, well, here's Ed from Pencil First Games and he needs some help. And I go, hey, Ed, and I do Ed's. And a couple of months later, Dr., you know, Steve comes back and goes, right, i got my next campaign. And at that point, I remember it was going – just wait one goddamn minute here. I mean, how many campaigns do you do in a year? And uh, how many projects do you do? And and it was that realization that um, we've got, you know, uh, any business, in any business, it's same with your backers. If you can get repeat customers, that's that's gold send. That's, you know, it, it's it's there because you don't your cost of acquisition is quite low. So we realized quite early on that that you guys do your serial entrepreneurs. You do several projects a year. So if we can add value and give a really good service, that you're automatically just gonna hopefully keep coming back. Not for everybody. It doesn't work for everybody. Sure. But sure. we have a lot of repeat customers. So you know, we Simon is um, obviously our biggest customer. I think I must have done forty to fifty projects with them. You know, just just and there the, by and, the, and, and and there's a scale there, right? So I think the other part of this is as 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 a, as a business, you're you're handling Simon, right, which is gigantic fulfillment projects, as well as super small first time creators. Yes. Um, but so let's so that's the background, right? That's the information. And if if somebody wants to go deeper in, we have our first video. Um, but so there's a lot of things going on right now in shipping and freight and VAT. And it's it's a hot topic, and it gets even hotter as of July first, and even customs issues and that kind of thing. So, just wanna this isn't gonna I, I I will be the first to say everyone should independently do their own research, find their own partners, have their own conversations. I, I don't uh, espouse or expect this to be a, a a final say on any of this, but I do think it's a, an interesting conversation to have, and and you're obviously dealing with it constantly. Um, so just I think I think a, a natural order would be sort of the freight to the VAT to the customs, perhaps. But when it comes to, um, you know, the exploding price in f freight shipping, right, cargo ships, yeah. um, you know, my opinion, I I'm of the opinion that th it, we're not done yet. I'm of the opinion that the problem is the shortage of these containers from the United States not sending them back because of the issues at the port and 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 basically – we're going to walk into a period of like ho holiday shipping and that's not going to let up until all that stuff come back. So I, I see this as easily continuing to be a problem all of 2021 and probably Q1 2022. That's like my personal opinion. What's your sense of it? What, what, what do you think is happening? What do you think? Well, I, I agree. And it's not just the shortage of containers. That's just one element of it. Um, there's an element of um, that the, the apparently, uh, I'm not an expert, but from what I'm hearing and, and seeing is that obviously they're also um, replacing a lot of the old diesel ships. So there's a yeah, there's actually the ship, a shortage the, of ships as well. And also because of COVID, there's a shortage or has been a shortage of staff to, to man those ships. So it's been obviously like a perfect storm. And I think you're absolutely right. I think by the time things might get improved after the holiday season, well, then you're into Christmas and you're into peak season surcharging into into by the end of the year. Uh, and then after that, you know, our peak season normally 
stays in January because everybody's trying to get their stuff out before Chinese New Year. Um, and then you get to, I, don't, I can't see it potentially changing. I, for, I hope and pray it does. Um, it, it can be and it is a competitive market. Um, but yeah, I can't see it changing until after the Chinese New Year potentially. Yeah. Um, in, into, I mean, into 2022. Uh, but yeah. fingers crossed it might. And I don't have the dates in front of me, but for those not familiar, Chinese New Year is a, like a two-week dead period, uh, like uh, like quiet period uh, in China where like factories stop, everything sort of gets quiet. Everything, so, everything yeah. stops. Yeah, everybody has. And, it's a national. It's a national. It's three weeks, isn't it? I think Chinese New Year. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think it depends on the. But yes, it's long, and it's it's typically end of February, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in there. Um, it ranges. It changes every year. Yeah, it's normally yeah. the end of January, uh, either sometime end of January, beginning of February. It kind of overlaps. and it's long, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm of the I. So I'm in the position with Foliferous, my most recent campaign, where I'm currently dealing with this 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 problem, and you know, we just found out that our stuff isn't going to be done. Like, like it missed June, so it's like wrapping up in July, which is fine from a production standpoint. That's fine, but what that means is they're like. You know, companies won't even quote you for the next month. The the you know, I know Julie um, put some note that she got a quote one day, like talked about it, went back, and they're like, "Oh, the quote's gone up four thousand dollars or two thousand dollars." So it's really exploding right now. And again, you know, to the extent as a publisher or a Kickstarter creator, you're looking at Windows. I really do think you're you you know, in in the world where this gets better. I, I, I think you really need to be looking at a um, March, April type shipment of 2022. Now, not everyone has that luxury. You have Kickstarter backers who want their products. You have products you're trying to get for Christmas. Um, but I, I once you get the surge <laughs> charge chip, like, like there's July, like, let's give it, and, and shipping slow, but so July, like give it a full 60 days. If you ship in July, you, that's September, August is October. If you're shipping in September, that's like your last window, right, on an extended delay to get it, where where you're like, even with a slowdown, um, and I th- I just think it's going to get so so uh, amazingly expensive. And then again, I I think it'll come down a little, but it won't re- it won't be anywhere close to returning until all the 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 the, equi- the, the ships are back online, the car goes back. So it's 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 crazy. And so there's no okay. And so actually, uh, the last thing I'll do, I'll plug for this topic. One of the things that we're seeing is a number of uh, Kickstarter creators and publishers are trying to work together. It turns out a lot of us work and ship from the same factories <laughs> uh, and, you know, trying to say, um, <coughs> hey, like right now what I'm working on is, hey, Lucky Duck Games, you're shipping out of Watts around when I am. And hey, Surf and Meeple, you're shipping out of Watts where, where, where I am. Is Is there an opportunity where instead of a, you know, the containers are like 20 feet containers and 40 feet containers you don't want to ship an empty 40 feet container but the price between the two is actually not that big um so so if you can fill a 40 which as a as a which i can't typically do because i'm a smaller publisher but if if with some other folks you can fill a 40 um you know i'm not going to say it's half price but it it, you know it it, depending on the ratio and depending on stuff it's certainly cheaper (coughs) so there's uh some new kickstarter groups that are are forming really for creators and publishers, it's not like, you know, it's not just conversation. It's really, where's your product? Where's it going? How much? What's the actual CBM, like the cubic measure, feet, feet measurement of your f- freight? Uh, and let's see if we can split up. It's like it's like share and attack. It's like the Uber. You know, it's like, hey, ha- maybe we can go to the same place and save some yeah, dollars. And, and another another little tip there as well is if. Um let's imagine you've gone over to a 20 foot container and you're going to have to go to a 40 foot container. Well, why don't you loose load the 20 foot? Um, it, it, it's going to cost you a loading fee to load it up and a loading fee the other end, but it's still a hell of a lot cheaper than yeah. going. Well, let, let, let's talk about that because I'm, a, I'm literally like, I just approved doing that. So loose loading is literally like filling a gigantic storage unit with your boxes from the ground up in every corner and tucking in. It, it would be like you're, you're packing a move and you're filling the back of a moving truck. Correct. That's that, that, and this is a big moving truck and that is different than what you would normally do, which is pallet loading, which Correct. is pallets. Like you, you see, you know, or, you know, around your neighborhood maybe, or like in some park or like next to a, a Seven Eleven. 
they're the wooden things that a forklift goes underneath and lifts everything. And so the right. value there is everything's fixed on top of it, very stable. It's a flat ground. It typically, it, sometimes they're wrapped, sometimes they're not. Um, but it's all, it's lifted off the ground and generally more secure. So Correct. Yeah. Correct. there, and so what you're for the extra, I think for us, it was the difference of five cubic meters, which is a pretty good amount of size to be on pallet versus off pallet. I, I'd have to go back and look, but basically you're saving a lot of space because they're not lifted up. The, the pallets have like some dead space. So pallet, pallet to pallet, there's a little space. Um, but they're easy to load on and off. If there was some sort of ground leak, the the they do you you are raised off the the base the base of the unit correct um yeah. and and then just generally you're probably not able to do as many stupid things like oh I think this will fit um and you know and you know it, it is a boat on an ocean right yeah um yeah. I mean Simon who as I mentioned Simon they loose load all their containers yeah they arrive to us loose, all loose loaded. We don't tend to, and obviously you you have to fill it, you know, or or make sure when it's loose loaded, it's at a, at a, all at a certain height. But yeah, I can say honestly that we um, we've not had any horrendous um, damage. In fact, I've seen more damages where pallets have not been have been overstacked and have toppled on top of each other inside a container, um, as opposed to damages from a loose loader. Yeah. But yes, there is always a risk. I mean, there's a risk no matter what you do. So. Yeah, yeah. But that is, that is a, it is a new thing, and uh, Pencil First Games will be loose loading. So <laughs> we, will, we will see how it goes. But it's, 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 it's not new. It's just not being thought of enough. Um, it's always been a thing. Um, I mean, I've been dealing with Seymour for five years. They've always loose loaded their containers. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's, but, it's not but new. But in this day and age, you, you not necessarily need it because, you know, I mean, we used to ship a couple of cubic meters for, you know, four or five hundred pounds. And now it's probably about a thousand pounds. It's crazy. Um, so, you, you you know, you you um, it's not really been necessarily going to be that much of a cost savings, you know, unless you are filling lots of containers. But yeah. Oh, All well right. done, you, Ed. Good thinking, me. Yeah, well, well, yeah. I might know who told you that. I wonder if it was me. Uh, yeah. Another well, but, 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 the, and then, and then, you know, you, you also then have, you know, you just people have to do better inventory as things are getting split up. Um, right. But okay, so we talk. We'll just keep keep rolling. So we, so you're you're actually on a boat. Now let's talk yeah. for a second. So ob for for folks who are probably watching, there has been dramatic. Um, uh, I, w I I don't necessarily want to say changes though brexit has certainly been a, a change but uh, a re-establishment of expectations around vat and its execution within different countries uh and so uh you know the eu split uh, Bre uh, U the uk split from the eu both had to like re-establish and affirm their um uh, vat value added tax right that's correct uh, same as your sales tax yeah. in the US. Sa your okay. sales tax and 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 have implemented some new rules that go into effect uh, July first. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the UK has already gone to effect. The, the, the UK has already, already gone to effect. The, yeah, the that EU could look into effect in January. Yeah, yeah. January the 3rd. And so, without like again, because I don't want to, I'm I'm I have I've been asked to do a video on this topic ex extensively, and I'm just super re resistant because I don't want to like give somebody bad information and have them run with it. But generally speaking. W now, at the point of sale, when when the, the thing is bought from Amazon, arguably from Kickstarter, which is a little bit of a gray area, but pretty much from Kickstarter, you are supposed to be charging, and sometimes it's in the ple pledge manager, in, if it's a UK or EU, sale, this VAT. Um, and if you need to mark that, and then you need to report it, and then you need to go through a whole process around it. Um, it's very, very simple. It's very, very simple. No matter what you've sold, how you've sold it, how much you've sold it for, where you've sold it, what platform you've sold it on, um, you have a fiscal responsibility to charge VAT, to collect VAT, and to give that VAT to the to the to the appropriate governments. If you are selling on Amazon, Amazon are termed as an online marketplace. The law states that these online marketplaces are responsible for doing that. Kickstarter, because you are transacting direct with the customer and they take a commission rather than with Amazon where they collect the money and then give it back to you, um, 
have somehow managed not to call themselves an online marketplace. Very grey area in terms of whether Kickstarter should technically be an online marketplace. But they say that they they've uh, they've had advice and they don't need to be an online marketplace. So you, as a publisher, have that fiscal responsibility um, to make sure you charge, collect, and 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 pay that back to the appropriate governments. Now, so, to make a distinction, and feel free to correct me in my distinction. That is what we're talking about if you're going through the process of EU-friendly um, sort of we're going imp- to ship it with, into the country and then, and then sh- ship it across as opposed to for uh, car- I think under 150 euro or 130 euro if you were going to uh, if you sold a widget for $20 or $40 or whatever but under that uh, threshold and you're saying hey this is going to be delivered, and it's 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 a cust- the 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 customer the receiver is responsible to pay that in customs clearance. That is That's a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so yeah. the distinction here, generally speaking, is the world of Kickstarter over the last five years, and value add and competitive Kickstarter has created this world where many Kickstarter creators it became the norm to essentially be importers. You, you, you are importing mass volumes of product into a country. And when you do that, it's a little different than, you know, selling somebody a $30 thing and saying when it gets to, you know, whatever, France, you deal with, you pay for your, the, the luxury of ordering it, right? right. Um, and so I think that's one of the, the struggles um, that's happening right now. And, 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 and again, it, it certainly has been complicated. But so you, you're obligated to, to charge it, and again, in this category where you then import it. And then when you import it, um, you know, that's where it's – so you've charged it. You're paying it monthly. And then um, in that model, do you do anything special during the import or is it only – through the normal reporting when it's accrued, like is there is there a check that happens later, or is it just that first process? Yeah, each each um, we're having some problems in terms of the way the EU have changed at the minute uh, with importation. But ultimately, um, let's look at the UK. Once you're back registered in the UK, you have an EORI number. You you then import that those goods under the cost of manufacturing because in effect you're selling it to yourself. Um, you know, um, and because you, you're taking ownership of those goods because you're back registered, um, you claim all that VAT back. That that that's all claimable back okay and, and in fact once you're back registered you can now do something called postpone batting which means you don't even have to pay for it because you're gonna you're gonna declare the sales on your um on your on your back return and then then you are declaring uh, uk is quarterly you declare all the sales you've made um into uk residents and you pay the tax on your tax return um, um, uh, there for all the sales you've made. If you've sold product to people outside of the UK, just like Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, you're not going to pay any VAT on those sales at all. It's only to the U- it's only to UK residents that you uh, that you are paying VAT on. Um, similar with um, with the EU, um, and I just got off the, a call prior to this where. Uh, actually, an old customer, which is which is coming back to us, hopefully, um, you know, has been given so much information information that he got quoted for back registering in 32 EU countries, which is just complete rubbish. You don't need to do that. Um, the EU, again, similar. Once you do an import, you should be able to claim that import VAT back, um, um, and then you are declaring sales on on the the sales you have made to countries within the EU. Um, and so, while I'm there, I'll carry on in terms of how that goes and and just dispel any misconception anybody has in terms of do that you do not have to register in every single country in the eu um, it's very simple you will back register in one country we're recommending germany because if ever you want to go and trade at essen um, you will need to be back registered in germany to go and trade at essen I mean, no bones about that um, people say oh i've done it in the past well you, you're breaking the law if you take stock into a country and you go to a show to sell you are liable to to be back registered in that country so that obviously takes care of that plus our warehouse in germany which so that that helps uh, as well so once you're doing that you then have the ability to register what's called an os which is a uh, online um, sorry a one-shop stop system um that allows you to go through that one registration to declare all of your sales within Europe, um, no matter what the country, with the various different tax rates. And you can do that through your OS registration. 
if you say then, well, um, I just want to store products in the UK and I want to ship from products in the UK, you could then got what's called an, an IOS. Now, you could ship from the US with your IOS registration. Right. And that's called an international one shop stop system. And that allows you on your label. It's got to be encrypted because they don't want people you know, stealing your IOS number. Um, you then with the IOS number, which would be an encrypted barcode on your label, when it gets scanned at the border, they uh, there's no customers to pay, no duties to pay because you're going to pay that through your IOS reporting um, system. So your customers won't pay the VAT and they'll be paid the VAT. So that gives you that flexibility. So, I mean, this particular customer, I think he was quoting something like $15,000 to get VAT registered in all these countries, which is just crazy. Um, we've now put him into a partner that that's going to be, you know, a, a and, third of that. But, um, and yeah. and, and, and the, the distinction for IOS, um, because, you know, I was looking at this as well, that is the one where you're not trying to uh, it, 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 you're you're not importing it within, so you can opt in or opt out of it. If you opt right. out of it, that's when you're saying, "Hey, customer, you're paying for this. I'm shipping from out of country. It's on you." If I opt into it, I'm going to pay for it, um, but I can't then import a bunch of stuff into Germany. That's when you're sending it from. If this is the EU, that's when you're sending it from outside the country. Yeah, for if you're sending parcel from outside of the EU, um, so let's say you do run rate. Uh, orders on your website um, right. and you want to ship from America, you have your IOS registration and then you are, that'll be on your label and that will go through customs because you are paying, you are, you've taken the liability to pay that back. And everybody goes, well, sorry, I'm not going to pay DAP, I'm going to pay duty unpaid and the customer can pay it. Well, just be careful in terms of what you think there. First of all, the cost of shipping is very, very high. And more importantly, um, the reason it's very high is because you or the customer and probably the customer will have to pay an admin fee for that to happen. You know, the couriers don't do this for, the, for their own benefit. They're going to charge. We were sending DAP from the UK when the, the new law kicked in, when we left Brexit. We were always trying to send DDP, but a few passes went through. And the customer not only had to pay the VAT, but they had to pay a six pound admin fee. And this is within an economy track service. People like FedEx and DHL who do, um, who do that charge, charge a lot more. To do duty unpaid so you know yes you can do it but your sales would be really low because yeah it's it, gonna be very it, 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 i think it, it's true and actually i ran into a problem interestingly with fedex in canada on a campaign maybe a few years back where uh i had intended to pay like the way it was shipped was they they pay we, we didn't pay duty up front we they paid it on receipt and a bunch of people were getting you know the three dollar customs fee or the four dollar customs fee they expected and then a ten dollar fedex fee to set up a fedex account uh yep. and so and 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 it that feels ridiculous you're like i agreed to pay customs i didn't agree to pay ca fedex ten dollars why why and that was its own mess i had to deal with and that was has has since been averted but so but there is a difference i mean I, you know everyone has different sized businesses but um what you do for a Kickstarter where this is the international platform where you're going to see hundreds, if not thousands of international backers, depending on the size of the campaign, versus, you know, for an example, with PencilFirstGames.com, where, you know, we sell 10 packages a month worldwide, in, in nine of which are in the U.S., one of which is somewhere, right? That is not a gigantic value. Maybe it's not worth going through that other headache for. But certainly when it comes to a Kickstarter... That's where we do have a sizable amount of, of, you know, um, issues to deal with. So, um, certainly there are these different avenues, and understanding it's important. If you want to talk to this fine gentleman, Nigel, uh, he's always he's always happy to get on the phone and chat with folks. Um, so why don't we, you know, uh, go to the sort of last piece? Because I, I, and again, it's one of those things where I'm sort of like everyone, you got to learn your own stuff. But so the other not. Again, this isn't it, it's less about necessarily like a huge change as it is maybe some heightened scrutiny. Um, but this is on the on, on just essentially customs, CE mark, UKCA mark and understanding that. And, and again, um, for those who aren't aware, every I assume every country, we only talk about the UK, EU and the US typically, but all countries have some amount of customs and labeling requirements somewhere. Um, we may not talk about them as much or they may not care as much, but certainly in the United States, 
um, the UK and the EU, there's sort of different expectations for product uh, selling a product uh, into the States and who that audience of that product is and essentially whether or not it's a toy and how it's clarified, right? And so um, there's an interesting carve out in the United States around um, whether or not an, a, 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 a board games actually are not considered toys unless they're targeted or marketed to 10 and under, and then they are, and they have different expectations around them. So that's some of the conversation people have around, oh, is it 8 plus or 10 plus or 13 plus or 14 plus comes from that. That's also distinct from what Amazon might say. Like Amazon may have different requirements and expectations that's necessary, not necessarily the same as the U.S. federal government. Uh, and yeah. that also create, that also creates some confusion um, yeah. because you're like, oh, well, I want to be on Amazon and they say I need this. It's like, well, Amazon does, but, you know, that's because you're selling on Amazon. But like, let's not that, I'm, I'm not going to say the U.S. side of it is, is anywhere that you, you deal with. So let's 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 talk about the U.K. and uh, EU. So one after breakfast, it's split. Um they both have somewhat parallel customs requirements, but they're no, they're not the same, right? Generally speaking. Yeah, correct. Um, yeah, everybody is actually used, and we were we, from harsh experience recently with one of my regular customers who had a twenty foot container being stopped by German customs because obviously when you know the U, we never had any problems with the UK customs with the CE mark um, at all. Nobody ever stopped it and I looked at it because it was in English. So, you know, so the safety warning, naught to three, blah blah, choking, that was on there. That was all fine. But when you put a CE mark um, on your game, you are literally saying this is a toy, and it's for, and it's got to be suitable for children under the age of fourteen. That's what a CE mark does. So, well, this particular customer was stopped, and um, we, we had a nightmare. We, we we managed to get into a bonded warehouse because customers wouldn't clear it. They said. There's no safety instructions in German. And we were going, yes, of course, because now we're importing into Germany and um, and therefore it's going to go into free circulation. So therefore, the safety instructions need to be in German. Now, the German customers were really actually quite nice about this. And they said, right, you know, we, we understand. We, we get where that's coming from. And because originally the panic was, oh, my God, for, for guys, we're going to have to unwrap every single game and put safety instructions in every single game but actually the German customers were quite good and they said well what we want is a PFD and we want six copies to go into so if there's a case of six games we want the carton opened up and those those safety instructions put in each of the cartons so they then can go with the games which was great so now we're advising people that if you use and I was speaking to another publisher quite a well-known publisher actually he said yeah he said I stopped using the C mark um, four years ago and I put C mark on there for that exact reason because when he went to he imported to France and had exactly the same reason so you don't need to see mark on your board game if it's uh, aimed at that age group of 14 and above and and the UK C, say, CA mark is exactly the same as the C mark it's now called the UK CA, CA mark and when you look at um, if you google that on uh, on, on, on google rather than anywhere else, I suppose. Um, it very clearly says it's for electronics, blah, 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 and for toys. And and it will tell you it pretty much exactly the same. So if you are if you are aimed at a certain age group below a certain level, you, you need to have that, that UK C mark. But more importantly, what does that mean? What does that mean? It means, A, that making sure your factory, and I know it's only like a couple of hundred dollars these days to get done. It used to be thousands when we first started, um, is that you must have the safety instructions written in the language that is going yeah. into free circulation with. So Germany needs to be in Germany and English, obviously. Um, England, it needs to be in, in English. Now that could be, that if, if, the, if the warning notice is purely naught to three choking hazard, then that needs to be in there. But we do stress to people that this advice is we are not publishers. I don't publish games. I'm not a, I'm not a, an expert. This is only a very broad understanding. And you know, and I say to people, well, who can advise me? Well, really, your factory who needs to adhere to these standards should really be able to give you some really solid advice. But yeah, I don't know what yeah, they and, do. Anyway. Well, no, I, I, I think I think they. It's it's a cost of doing business. I think what what what. You know, because I went through a bunch of relabeling and, and, and sort of deep diving on a lot of this material and a part of, you know, because I think there's an inherent desire for a lot of people. I mean, I think 
oftentimes people do make family games and intend them for for for, for younger groups and, and want to be able to sell them um you know in an eight plus or ten plus category which is a decision you can make as a publisher or you can say i want to go the hobbyist route this game's targeted at adults i don't want to deal with any of this um which is reasonable but but part of what you're doing is it's the co- it's the cost of test because all those those labels are there's an expectation of uh a certain number of, of, of product testing that you need to do, which is what you were mentioning, which is cheaper than it was, but certainly not free. Um, and you also are faced with just dealing with the boxes is, is, is a bit of a pain. Like, you know, when we were wrapping up this print, last print run when the UK and UKCE, uh, the, the split happened and then going through and getting you who who another thing that comes up is having the the, the your an importer address is required for that as well so you need to say so this is the address within the uk or this is the address within europe that this is being imported by or associated with for your company so there are a number of requirements that you have to go through uh, and just the process of like getting it all in the box and updating so going through this whole process has been like one more change one more change one more change and it's just you know yeah uh, it there's a lot to it. So uh, again, I, I, uh, Nigel, thank you for the, the 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 perspective. I do really think folks need to read up on their own because ultimately, you're sort of. I, I think it's interesting. I'm without getting being political or getting deep into it. Generally speaking, there's like people who are like for regulations and requirements and safety, and there are people or for the. Uh, 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 Climate and uh, you know, a, 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 what is the word I'm looking for for the for the world, whatever it is. Uh, 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 what's the term for making safe products for the environment? Ecological side of things and like, I think it's really interesting because from for the small indie board game space, this is you're 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 dealing with like this is what regulations feel like, folks. Like when you have regulations, you have to deal with them. Like that's why that's why you hear stories about business people not liking regulations because they have to deal with all this, and it inherently comes with cost. So wherever you stand on that, that's what this is. It, it is country by country regulations, and if you're importing into other countries, you have to be aware of them and. You know, it is a it is annoying. It is a pain, and and that's you know what what a special label is, or what a special test to ensure that you hit a safety target, or or whatever. Um, that's what this all comes down to. And um, so, as a business owner, you're sort of deciding and calculating the market opportunity. Like, what does it mean to say eight plus on a game versus ten plus for a sale from a sales perspective versus the regulation regulatory cost or in, in the case you were suggesting about whether what what level of that do I want to deal with how big is the opportunity to be selling cheaply to, to European countries on my website versus not I, I can choose not ethically but you're just gonna have less sales right so that's right. what you have to yeah I, as with anything it's what's your PL you know I mean it's all it's all volume related isn't it you know if you you know um, I know small publishers and we, we are looking at other solutions which we will be able to announce in the next few months that will help smaller publishers but at this minute in time is what um you know what what's causing some uh, <laughs> one publisher or name went to a, another one of my partners who didn't know as a customer recommended back to me and i was saying to them have we done what have we done we upset you in any way no you're making me get back registered i was like hold on it's not me i'm not making you get back registered it's the law the law is making you get back registered i'm, I'm just the messenger john shoot the messenger but it was kind of interesting in terms of that is that actually you're absolutely right you are the business owner and you need to be aware of your responsibility and whether that is importing that as i say we can advise we can guide we can point but that's you know i'm not an accountant for god's sake i don't you know um i wouldn't wish to be either for that matter with all these changes but yeah um you you ultimately have that responsibility and you've got to weigh up the opportunity against the the, the, the cost it's called opportunity cost isn't it so yeah and so I, we covered a lot of topics. I think it's been about 40 minutes. I think with that, we should close. But again, um, there is information out there to research, but Ship Quest is a knowledgeable source. Um, and certainly if you're looking to deal with the EU, UK, and other worldwide uh, shipping, or, you know, again, I mean, if you're based in the UK or you're like, I'm, I'm, my perspective is obviously a US publisher, but um, 
is there is there a best contact for you uh, or for the company? Yeah. Um, so um, if you reach out to uh, um, um, the guy who sets up everything is uh, my my um, my brother. So it's Paul at um, at shipcrest.co.uk, and Paul will get all the information out for you, and then set a meeting up. Um, you know, we can schedule a meeting uh, to discuss your requirements and, and what you are. It's not going to cost you anything other than your time. So, um, yeah, we can kind of we can kind of take you from there. So, Paul at shipcrest.co.uk. Awesome, cool. Well, so thanks so much for being on and and uh, oh, pleasure, Ed. Right? Yeah, pleasure. So- hey, everybody, Edo here, and thanks for watching Gaming with Edo reviews over here on this playlist. League and insider videos over here on this one. Subscribe, share, all that good stuff. But most importantly, play some great games. Thanks.